The cyber landscape is ever evolving. So whether it be AI today or something else tomorrow, um, there are going to be, you know, those actors that are trying to exploit vulnerabilities. So what I think is more important is that we continue to be extremely vigilant and focused on what are our cybersecurity, um, what's our cybersecurity posture, what what are we doing to secure our organisations. You know, it's a well-known fact that it's not, you know, this the statement is often made, it's not if, it's when. So it's actually how you're able to recover. It's actually ensuring that you have the policies, that you have the technology and the capability within your organisation to respond um, to, the, to the threats or to the potential um, vulnerability that you may have. Cyber security and cyber resiliency has been, has been an issue for obviously a, a number of years and there's been some high-profile cases in Australia of citizen data leaks. It's a focus of our industry and focus of government as it should be. In terms of the threat of AI to aid cyber security threats, Yes, it is, it is an issue, but it's going to take AI to beat AI. So AI tools are being used by cybersecurity companies now and are available for organisations to use to help with, th for example, threat detection and monitoring at scale and remediation once a threat is detected. So AI can be used to stop and inhibit cyber attacks. But yes, it will be used like every other tool by the criminals as well. So it will be a fight and a war. Uh, for supremacy in this front as it is with many others. When we think about a cyber criminal and how they would utilise AI, um, the reality is it's always good to remember that cyber criminals have always been advancing and prioritising and strengthening their capability like any other. What cybercrime looked like 20 years ago absolutely has evolved and it has continually been a mirror reflection of where we're at with society. So it's not hard to look at that it is being operationalised by criminals and used to basically advance not necessarily the sophistication but certainly the quantity of the way that they are able to enforce these cyber cyber attacks. Then when we look at AI as a defensive capability, it's also to remember that we kind of run at a similar scale. We're looking at organisations taking artificial intelligence and trying to operationalise it, become familiar with it, and basically expand their ability to be able to use it as a defensive capability. Right now, it's a bit of a net sum game. So as the threat actors have been becoming more advanced, so have our organisations, and none of the party has been really stagnant. Um, so we see it almost like it's cancelling each other out. But as with any emerging technology, it's one of those things where time will tell. We'll only be able to see over time whether AI truly has been weaponised the way we've assumed it will be, and likewise whether we've been able to really catapult it as a defensive capability as well. I definitely think there's there, there's a need for digital police like any other police in in our lives. There's needs to be more stringent cybersecurity laws around AI. But on the other side, I also think that adoption of AI in the day to day lives and at our work is is not going to be stopped by not having that regulation. So we should definitely continue work in a parallel world of developing those regulations and having that digital police developed, but continue to embrace AI. If you sort of looked at our demographic and our timescale in Australia, you'd see pretty rapid increase of cybersecurity uh, born and bred firms in Australia, but also some of the global players increasingly opening up their operations in Australia, which is a really positive sign, but also one of a recognition that cybersecurity is an imminent threat, but also one where we've recognised the impacts of it here in Australia as well. 2024 is probably one of the most active years in engagement with government in, than I can remember. We've put in 15 submissions just to the federal government alone this year. It's almost two, it's over two a month. So the level of activity is high. Now, the level of activity has also been met with success. So we've had in the budget uh, a lot of money invest, hundreds of millions invested into digital identity legislation that's been passed. That was not guaranteed. That was highly contentious. But we've paved the way to ensure that it got through the Senate, it was bipartisan support, and it got funded. Now, that's going to lead to parallel funding for MyGov, which is going to aid those cybersecurity threats where personal information gets leaked. When the digital identity scheme is fully rolled out, there will be less personal identifiable information from citizens going to prove your identity to various different corporates out there and to government. So when a cyber breach occurs, you're less likely to have your passport, your driver's licences and other personal information floating around there in the dark web and be used against you. So that's a really, really important step. Um, Privacy Act reforms are going ahead this year. There's some really important developments in there that we've been advocating for that we're really pleased to see. 
um, cybersecurity reforms, more legislation occurring this year that we were heavily last year advocating for sensible reforms and adoption there. AI regulations are about to be announced by the government. We've been involved behind the scenes in working groups to ensure that what the government does in those areas of regulation, the industry can support. I think it's a really promising start that the government is showing some meaningful um, investment um, and focus on digital ID. I think beyond just the platform that creates a singular storage place for identity documentation, I think the significance of the government's digital ID initiative and the scheme is actually about how it is a security capability to make cybersecurity and as aligned to its cybersecurity strategy, the securest country by 2030. And I think it really well aligns with trying to identify how identity documents in recent breaches have been the key aspect that have made a lot of Australians vulnerable. So the real strength of digital ID is thinking about how to secure lives for Australians. We can never stop trying to catch up and to overcome the cyber criminal. Um, when I think about the industry, government and at scale response to scams, some of the pro promising signs I've certainly seen is the government's first ever investment into a national anti-scam centre. Uh, and aside from the name and the financial investment, I think what's fantastic about it is recognising that it takes an all-industry approach. Um, we've had banks for many years now grappling with trying to minimise fraud and scams for some time now, but it's time to look at the ecosystem. Scams don't happen just in financial institutions alone. They're aided by things like telcos because a lot of these happen via text message. Um, they're also aided by large tech industry as well because they happen often on social media. I think... Um, the sooner we can not just educate people but work across industry to identify how these happen, pick them up as quickly as they can and then take them down as rapidly as possible, the best chance we have of circumventing them before they fall in the hands of a vulnerable individual. And that's the second point is when we think about scams, it's really important to be nuanced. It's really easy to step back and just say, oh, it impacts all Australians. But in reality, we've got more vulnerable groups. We've got the elderly to think about. We've got those who are in, um, let's say, certain socioeconomic circumstances as well. And then the vector I'm particularly concerned with is young people. Um, how do we educate and empower them at an early age to be able to, to deal with these types of evolving threats as best as possible so we've got a stronger chance in the future to be able to get ahead of these cyber criminals?